for those of y'all who are watching this video right now, uh, I'm here with my discipleship group, and we are still in the same sitting situation and all that stuff as we were in the last video you watched. And that's because we finished that video approximately like 30 seconds ago. Um, the last video was on the inerrancy of the Bible, uh, and we are continuing our way through this, and we're going to be talking about the sufficiency and the canonicity of the Bible. Uh, I just wanted to split those up into separate videos so that they were easier to find for y'all, and they weren't as long. Uh, that being said, we are currently talking about how we view the Bible. We've talked about the inspiration, the authority, and the inerrancy of the Bible. Now we're going to talk about two final things. Uh, and then next week, we're going to go into how we read the Bible, which, if I'm being entirely honest, um, I'm really excited about. Um, because this is just my opportunity to help people learn how to actually engage in Scripture. And, like, like honestly, the next unit, where we're going to start next week, um, it's probably the most practical unit of all the different ones that we're going to go through. Um, because I'm hoping that the principles we talk about there will literally shape how you read the Bible going forward and will help you get the most depth out of it, but also the best understanding of it. And so I'm really excited for that. That being said, I don't want to downplay this stuff, uh, but I will admit that th this is more just like theological jargon, stuff like that. Not as fun to talk about to me, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, it's still fun. So the sufficiency of the Bible, let me tell you what I mean by the sufficiency of the Bible. Once again, this is taken from my doctrinal synthesis paper that I wrote for seminary. I believe that scripture is sufficient. That is, I believe that scripture being inspired by God thoroughly equips the servant of God for every good work. I believe that scripture contains the very will of God and that it is therefore wholly sufficient all that is needed for the knowledge of salvation and for godly living. That is for life and for godliness. I do not believe that scripture is all that God has provided, does provide or will provide but instead that it contains all that is needed to accomplish his will on earth, and that, therefore, anything offered in addition is excess, grace upon grace. I believe that, being sufficient, the word of God is worthy to be studied and learned. All right, anything in there that sticks out to y'all? Or anything I need to explain? It's interesting... The phrase grace upon grace. Mm -hmm. I know what grace is, but. Yeah. Do you know where I took that phrase from? I gotta fact check myself real quick before I say it. It's from the Gospel of John, right? Am I tripping right now? Yes, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's from the prologue of the Gospel of John. Yes, from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. Um, yeah, so basically what I'm saying is that um, um, I'm affirming that Scripture is sufficient to help us live for God and live faithfully to God, right? That whenever you actually examine the text of Scripture, it is all that we need for life and godliness, right? But that's not all God's given, right? Because God is a God of grace, and so even though we receive Scripture by grace... Because he didn't have to give us that. Um, he has given grace upon grace, right? He has given us even more so that we can say, like David in Psalm 23, that our cup overflows. Right? That's what I'm really trying to get at there. Uh, and so we have to ask the question, does the Bible claim to be sufficient? Uh, and this is where we're going to go back to our favorite Bible verse, uh, which y'all are probably tired of already. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. The doctrine of sufficiency is probably most clearly articulated in the verse you've probably all gotten tired of hearing. <laughs> All scriptures God breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. That last phrase right there uh, is the one we probably haven't focused on as much lately. Um, we focus on a lot of the other ones, right? So whenever it says all scriptures God breathed, that's where we get the word for inspiration, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then it's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Well, that would imply that it is authoritative, right? Uh, and then inerrant kind of fits behind all of this, right? Because God is equipping you to go out and follow these things, which means that apparently it's true, right? Uh, he's not just like, he didn't just give you lies, right? No, you're supposed to conform your life to it, so it's true. Um, but then sufficiency is in those final words, which in Greek read this. Pros pan ergon agathon ex, oh, oh gosh. Except right? Uh, and I kind of broke it down right here, right? The word pros means for, to, or unto, which is a preposition. Pan means every or all, 
right? Like think like pandemic or like pantheon, stuff like that. Pan means all. Uh, Ergon means work. Agathon means good, right? It's like the word, like the name Agatha or something like that. Uh, Exertismenos uh, means to complete, to equip, or to furnish, right? The imagery that really Paul is going for here whenever he says this uh, is of a warrior going into battle fully outfitted to accomplish the task that is set before him, right? That is what God has given us with Scripture, right? And Paul, like this isn't the first time that Paul has used Scripture in warlike imagery, right? If you go back to Ephesians, the armor of God, uh, what is the sword of the Spirit? The Word of God. The Word of God. Right? And so scripture is supposed to be, you know, it's a sword, right? In this instance, it's almost like scripture is your armor itself, right? It gives you everything you need, right? So that whenever the Christian goes out into the world, they are fully outfitted, right? They have everything they need to stay warm during the winter and stay cool during the summer. Everything they need to endure hardship and to endure prosperity, right? That is what scripture is able to do for you, according to Paul. Right? It thoroughly equips you. It doesn't just equip you. It thoroughly equips you for every good work. Not just good works. Every good work. Right? He could just say, oh, it equips them for good work. No. Thoroughly equips you every good work. Right? He's being exhaustive here. He's saying it is sufficient. Right? You do not need anything in addition to this to live a life of godliness. Interesting thing, though. Whenever Paul says all scripture, what does he probably have in mind? Old Testament, right? Why would lead you to that conclusion? Because the New Testament hasn't been fully put together yet. Yeah, I mean, um, the New Testament just hasn't been fully written yet, right? I mean, there are certain things that he definitely viewed as Scripture at this time period, because if you remember back in 1 Timothy, he quoted Luke alongside Deuteronomy, and he quoted it as Scripture. And so he definitely viewed that there were some New Testament texts that belonged to the category of Scripture, but ultimately, if he's just using this term broadly speaking, he's probably talking about the Old Testament. Which is really cool, because that means even the New Testament itself is our cup overflowing. Because what Paul's really saying is that even if we just have the Old Testament, right? Think about this. This is something that you will not hear preached in many churches, but this is what Paul's saying. Even if you just have the Old Testament, you would have everything you needed for life and godliness. Right? You would have everything you needed to be saved, and you would have everything you needed to live faithfully to God. You might not know the name of Jesus, but you would at least anticipate his coming. And there were a lot of people in the Old Testament. I mean, literally Abraham, Genesis. He already believed in God and counted it, it was counted him as righteousness, right? Uh, and so there's enough revealed in the Old Testament to where you could say you are thoroughly equipped. But God didn't just give us the Old Testament. He also gave us 27 books in the New Testament, which go out and explicitly outline things. Right? Things that were mysterious in the Old Testament are explicitly stated in the New Testament. That's why a lot of times I'll make that joke that uh, you know, the Old Testament, uh, you know, it's, it's the book, and then the New Testament is just the appendix. Right? It's like the afterthought. Originally, that was a joke, but the more I reflect on this passage, the more I realize it's kind of true. Right? It's like, in a, like whenever you're in class, and the Old Testament's your workbook, and the New Testament's the answer sheet. A lot of the times, as Christians, we just jump straight to the answer sheet, and that's kind of cheating. Right? Paul is saying right here that even if you just have the Old Testament, you have everything you need to live faithfully to God. The New Testament, though, it takes away all of our excuses. Right? Because now everything that, like, with the Old Testament, you can get there, but you had to study it deeply. The New Testament, all you have to do is read the first verse of the New Testament. You've got all the answers already laid out for you. Right? The book of the genealogy of Jesus the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You're like, oh, okay. I guess his name is Jesus. <laughs> right? Uh, and so the New Testament lays it out for you to where you have literally no excuse to not be living faithfully to God. And if you actually read through the New Testament epistles, that's kind of what the apostles are arguing, right? Um, that's why, like, you read Romans chapter 1, and he's like, everybody's without excuse because we're all sinful before God. And you get to Romans chapter 2, and then he says, therefore you have no excuse, you who judge. And he's like, <laughs> uno reverse card. <laughs> you're the person who has no excuse for living sinfully because you're over here looking down on the world and that's because you know it's sinful and therefore you know you're sinful, right? Uh, so the New Testament is our cup overflowing. God has already given us everything we need, but then he gave us 27 extra books as if verse 39 weren't enough, right? So that's what's really cool about that. So continuing with this thought, does the Bible claim to be sufficient? Firstly, scripture claims to be sufficient for righteousness, Right? 
Uh, if you actually read through those, Genesis 15, 6, I already quoted that verse, right? Abraham believed in God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. That means that before the first book of Genesis was ever even written, enough had been revealed for somebody to become righteous in the eyes of God. Because Abraham didn't write the book of Genesis. Moses did, hundreds of years later. But you already had a person who was made righteous in the eyes of God simply by believing. And now, once Moses has documented it, well, now we know what it means to be righteous in the eyes of God. Mm -hmm. What you do is you look at Genesis, and you have to examine it and figure out, okay, well, how did Abraham become righteous? By believing. What did he believe in? Right? And so already, you have something that teaches you how to become righteous in the eyes of God. And you keep reading through it, and again and again and again, Scripture teaches you that it can help you become righteous in God's eyes. Scripture also claims to be sufficient for salvation, right? Go to John chapter 20. Um, that's his whole point at the end, right? He says, you know, um, I write these things to you so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He explicitly says, that's why I'm writing this book. I'm writing it to you so that you can be saved. Mm -hmm. There you go. Bada bing, bada boom. Uh, now you have no excuse, right? That's what John's saying, right? Does that mean that you could only know how to be saved once you got to the New Testament? Well, no, because Abraham was already righteous in the eyes of God in the Old Testament, right? And whenever we die and we go to the place where God is, there's going to be a lot of Old Testament people there, right? So there's going to be a lot of Old Testament people who were saved. They didn't know the name of Jesus. They didn't know he'd die on a cross exactly, but they knew enough. But once you get to the New Testament especially, John's literally writing a book saying, hey, if you've made it to chapter 20, you ain't got no excuse anymore, right? Because I literally wrote this whole book so that you would know how to get saved, right? You know Jesus, Son of God, and now you know to believe. If you do those things, you're saved. Boom, there you go, right? And so it is sufficient for salvation. Scripture also claims to be sufficient for godliness, right? You go read Psalm 19 and Psalm 119. Those books are all about, like, I love your law. It's my meditation day and night. I love your word. I love your decrees. I love your statutes, right? Who can measure up to your law, right? That's what all those are about. And if you keep reading through all these other accounts, um, James chapter 2, right? There's the, uh, here's the word, doers of the word, stuff like that. Um, that's what 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. We just quoted verses 16 and 17. But if you go to the verses just preceding it, that's Paul's whole point, right? He's saying, uh, I'm actually going to be covering this on Wednesday. Um, not these verses. I'm going to be covering 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 6 through 13, right? So the verses right before this. Um, but the whole context of 2 Timothy chapter 3 is that Paul says, in the last days, there's going to be all these people doing all this ungodly stuff, and people are going to be manipulating people, and there's going to be people in ministry who the reason they're successful is not because they're being honoring to God. It's because they're preying on the vulnerable. And he says, Timothy, you can't do that. You need to follow in my example. And you need to live according to the testimony of Scripture. Because according to Paul, Scripture is the thing which equips you to live godly. Mm -hmm. All Scripture is God-breathed and is used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped, equipped for every good work. That, that's the whole context behind that whole thing. right? His whole point is Timothy. If you study scripture, and if you build your life on scripture, you will be godly, right? Fourthly, scripture claims to be sufficient for knowing truth. Uh, once again, Psalm 19 and 119, I had to quote those once again because they're all about truth, right? And how delightful God's word is. John chapter 8, uh, you will know the truth, the truth will set you free. John chapter 17, he's praying to God. He says, your word is truth, right? All of these verses show that Scripture is not simply teaching you about these spiritual realities or these life application things, right? Uh, it does do both of those, right? It teaches you how to become righteous in the eyes of God. It teaches you how to have eternal salvation. It teaches you how to practically live in day-to-day -day life. But those aren't the only ways it's sufficient. It's also sufficient because of what it can teach you in here. It can teach you what is true and therefore what is not true. So you can distinguish between those two things. Right? That's the whole purpose of the book of Proverbs. Right? It is to teach you wisdom and discernment so that in the moment you can learn to discern between what is true and what is not and live accordingly even whenever scripture doesn't specifically outline it. 
right? So the book of Proverbs is giving you principles and practices to apply so that in the places where scripture is silent, you can still learn to navigate through the difficult parts of life. Fifthly, scripture claims to be sufficient for knowing God's will, right? Um, this is just a huge thing throughout scripture, right? Um, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father, right? Well, what is the will of the Father? Well, I'll keep reading the Sermon on the Mount and you'll find out. Or go to John chapter 6, and he'll just explicitly tell you, right? And this is my Father's will, that you would believe in the Son, right? And that you would have eternal life, right? And so that's another really cool thing. Uh, throughout Scripture, we see several characters like David who are inquiring of God, and they're seeking God's will. And then God responds, and he shows them. And so you get to see how God responded to them in the moment, but then whenever you take in the full view of Scripture, you actually get to see God's overall will. And another cool thing is that uh, even whenever God's will isn't explicitly stated, it's being expressed from Genesis to Revelation. Because you're figuring out what does God feel the need to communicate to us, right? What is God's will for mankind? All right, well, start in Genesis, read through Revelation, and you'll see what God's will is for mankind. And you'll figure out how he plans about going about that and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you'll begin to make more sense of it as you adopt a biblical worldview. And so these are all the different ways that scripture is sufficient, right? It's sufficient for righteousness so that you can become right as of God. It's sufficient for salvation. And whenever we say salvation, I'm not just talking about, okay, I prayed a prayer and now I'm saved. I'm talking about salvation in all three senses of the word, right? Salvation um, in the sense of justification, right? So where God gives us righteousness, but that's kind of the first one. But then salvation in the sense of uh, sanctification, right? Uh, which is living a godly life. That's the third one. Uh, but then also uh, salvation in the sense of glorification, right? It is sufficient to teach us how we will one day share in that future resurrection with God, right? So it teaches us how we have been saved, how we are being saved, and how we will be saved, right? Uh, it's also sufficient for godliness, right? But a lot of times that's kind of how we just, like, a lot of times we just limit it to that. Uh, a lot of times we treat the Bible like it's just like a how-to manual to be a good person. That's not all it is, though. But it is sufficient for that. Like, if you want to know how to live rightly before God, the answer is in Scripture. Right? A lot of times we just, we want to go and say, like, God, how do I handle this scenario? And we want him to drop an answer from heaven. He could do that. Right? Hypothetically, he could. But if he's not doing that, the answer is probably in Scripture. Right? And that's why he gave it. Right? A lot of times we just want direct communications between us and him. But if he did that all the time, why would he have given us Scripture? Right? The reason he gave it to us is because it is a standard of truth to teach us how to conduct ourselves in life. And so that's why it's there. Were you say something? And explicitly he won't he won't tell us audibly what he you know what his will is because he wants us to walk through life by faith. Yeah, yeah. And um Yeah. And then it's sufficient for knowing truth and it's sufficient for knowing God's will, right? So all those are different ways where it, uh, scripture is sufficient, right? There's probably other ways in addition to that, but those are probably uh, the different ways that we could view it for now. All right, clarifying misunderstandings. While scripture does make certain claims about its sufficiency for life and godliness, we must recognize that the doctrine of sufficiency does not claim that scripture is sufficient for attaining all knowledge in the world, right? Um, that is one thing we need to be clear, right? Um, there are certain things that you will want to know that the Bible simply will not tell you, right? For instance, uh, well, there are things we might wish are found in Scripture but aren't. Uh, here's some examples. While Scripture certainly provides us with many amazing scientific, historical, and philosophical insights, it isn't a science, history, or philosophy textbook, nor does it seek to answer all of the scientific, historical, and philosophical concerns of a 21st century Western audience. Um, really funny example of this. Um, just very recently, I was leading my junior high students through the story of Exodus, right? Uh, and we got to the part where, uh, you know, Moses and Aaron are standing before Pharaoh, and they drop the staff on the ground, and it turns into a serpent. Uh, and then Pharaoh's magicians, uh, they also drop their staffs on the ground, and they turn into serpents. And then it says that Aaron's staff ate the other staffs, right? So the serpent ate the serpents, and then presumably it turned back into a staff. And my students looked at me and they said, so was his staff like thicker now? Well, you know, that's an answer that the scripture just doesn't tell us, right? 
Uh, could it have been? I don't know. Well, honestly, it's a question I never even stopped to ask, right? Because really, it's unimportant to the story, right? The whole point is that God is more powerful than the other gods, and therefore Moses and Aaron won out, right? That's the main point. But I loved where the junior high mind went. And, and this is something that I've noticed, especially with like younger minds. They're inquisitive, right? They want to know. Uh, and they ask questions like this, right? And they're like, like, okay, well, like whenever it says a multicolored coat, what colors was it? Right? Okay. There's just certain things the Bible's not going to tell us, yeah. right? But we also do this on a more fundamental level, right? Exactly what year was the Exodus? I don't know. It doesn't tell us. There are historical details that we can piece together to try to arrive at a correct date, but people will debate about it, right? Exactly how old is the earth? I don't know, right? Are you supposed to take Genesis 1? Are those dates supposed to be literal? I don't know. Wouldn't it be really helpful if Moses just said in there, like, by the way, these dates are to be taken literally. But he doesn't say that, right? And so there's room for debate, right? Uh, And so we have to realize that, yes, there are a lot of really cool historical and scientific insights and philosophical insights to be found in the Bible, but they're not going to answer every single question you have, right? There are going to be certain things that you wonder about that the Bible simply does not tell you. Um, And it's good for us to be aware of that, right? And the more you study scripture, the more you'll be aware of what it doesn't say. What is the name of that one effect thing, like the, um, where it's like... um, Dunning-Kruger. Dunning-Kruger effect, yeah, where it's uh, basically the idea... That um, basically people are usually, um, the more ignorant somebody is, the more confident they are in what they know. Um, But then the more well-versed they become in something, the more they become aware of what they don't know. And so like if you actually like put it like on X, Y axis or X, Y axis, you have like a person's confidence on the Y axis and like the amount of time they've spent studying it and their actual comprehension of the stuff. Uh, And it like spikes up really high and then takes a deep dip. Uh, And that's just because... Uh, whenever you're first beginning to study something, you think you know everything. But then as you study it more, you begin to realize, oh, I don't know that, and I don't know that, and you begin to understand, oh, wow, I'm lacking a lot of information. And so uh, I remember back in high school, man, I thought I knew everything about the Bible. Uh, and now uh, that I've studied it more and more and more, not only do I have a better understanding of the Bible, but I have a better understanding of what it doesn't actually say. And I actually am better equipped to say what I don't know. Right? There are certain things I used to speak confidently of, and now my students will ask me, and I'll say, you know what? That's a more complicated issue than I thought. Right? And, and I'm trying to teach them that. Right? Uh, but we just have to realize that there's certain places where the Bible just it's silent. Right? Was, the, was the flood of Noah's day, was it a worldwide flood or a geographical flood? Well, people will debate. Right? Um, I, I don't know. Sorry. I, I was wanting to go to some other stuff, but we'll just move on. While scripture certainly provides us with many answers to questions applicable in our own lives, it will not provide us with answers to every question we have ever wondered, nor were we the immediate audience it was originally written for. Right, so there's two things to realize there. Uh, First off, it won't answer all your questions. And secondly, it has no intention to answer all your questions because it wasn't even written for you. Right, nor did it answer all the original questions of the original audience. I mean, read the book of Habakkuk, right? I mean, literally, the prophet's like, God, why are you doing all these things? And God just says, the rights will live by faith. <laughs> God just says, you don't need to know all the answers. Same thing with Job, right? Job is like, God, why am I going through all this? And we, as the reader, know the answer, right? We know that God allowed Satan to tempt Job and have him go through all the suffering. Job does not know that. Job is simply asking God, why, why, why? And God says, Were you there when I created the heavens and the earth? So God says, you don't need to know all the answers. And so we have to realize that that's going to be the case with us as well. Right? There are going to be certain things you want to know. We're just not going to know. Like, what exactly, you know, like, what exactly is heaven going to be like? I don't know. There's certain things we can pick up on. We don't know a whole lot. Right? How many types of angels are there actually? I don't know. What, what was it like to be Jesus as a child? I don't know. Right? There's a lot of stuff you're just not going to know. Right? Um, why did God decide to stop speaking after the time of Malachi? I don't know. Right? There's going to be a lot of questions that you wonder, and you just won't know. Uh, and, and then people will always quote that one verse in 1 Corinthians 13, right? where it says, Now we know in part, 
but one day we will like fully know. They're misinterpreting that verse. Like what they'll say is they'll say, "Well, don't worry. Whenever we get to heaven, we'll know all things." Right? Mm-hmm. Well, that's not what that verse is about. It is not saying that once we get to heaven, we'll magically know everything. No, what it's talking about is that we know God partially now, but one day we will know him fully as we are fully known, right? The idea is that we will be with God and we will fully know him, right? So it's not talking about us having cognitive knowledge. It's talking about experiential knowledge in the sense of being in God's presence, right? Uh, And so I hate to break it to you, but there are a lot of questions that you have, and you might have them for eternity. Um, But who knows? Maybe, Maybe God will be gracious, and during eternity... He'll just give everybody a little sit down and be like, all right, let's, let's talk about this. And we'll just have like a big powwow in heaven and be like, all right, what was the deal with Noah and Ham? Like what, what happened there? Like what was, what was that about? Like, did you explain that? You know, like maybe that'll happen. I have no idea. I think my like secret, like, you know, my, my secret hope, which obviously is just like sci-fi thinking. Uh, I'm hoping we have, whenever we get to like the eternal state, that, you know, everybody's, like, in our house, we all have, like, holographic projections of, like, the world. Oh. And, like, you can just, like, yeah. spin it around, and you can just, like, pick a random place and, like, set a date and just, like, zoom in and, like, experience it. I think that'd be awesome. Wow. Yeah. That's not going to happen. <laughs> but <laughs> there's no biblical basis for that. I just, whatever I think of, like, my ideal situation, it's like, yeah, that'd be cool. Um <laughs> yeah, I'll be like, hey, God, can I have, like, what, like, I'll be like, God, you know what I've been wanting my entire life. Can I have one of those, like, just spend eternity looking at all these events in the street? Like, also, like, think about this. Things that we want to know about. What was going on in China at the same time period as, like, Abraham? I don't know. Right? Have you ever stopped to think? There's other <laughs> stuff happening in the world. Yeah. Right? The Bible's just telling us about certain events. Right? Whenever, like, what was happening over in the region of America whenever Moses is crossing the Red Sea? I have no idea, right? There's a lot of things you might want to know about. See, you weren't even thinking about those questions, and now I raise them, and you're like, I'm going to think about this forever. Like, yeah, that'd be possible. Wild, right? Uh, there's a lot of questions we have. We're just not going to know. Yeah. Right? While Scripture certainly provides us with many key insights to the supernatural realm, its primary goal is not to be a systematic theology of the unseen realm. Um, that's, supposed, that's supposed to be a space in between there. I was like creating a new word. Um, the main thing I'm highlighting there is that sometimes people will speak overconfidently about the unseen realm and like spiritual stuff. And they'll be like, let me tell you about all the types of angels and exactly what they do. We really can't do that, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Mainly because the Bible tells us a lot about the spiritual realm, but it doesn't tell us everything, right? Uh, And it definitely does not tell us enough to create a concise, systematic theology about these things. Uh, Usually whenever people do arrive at those, what they're doing is they're treating the Bible as being exhaustive in those places where it really isn't, right? Right? Uh, all you can do is say, oh, well, in this instance, this is what's going on here. But you have to realize the Bible, like, it doesn't tell us everything about that because it's not something we need to know. The only insight the Bible gives us into the unseen realm is the stuff that is necessary for us to comprehend things in the world that we're living in, right? Because you have to realize that there's an unseen realm around us right now, yep. right? Remember the story in Kings whenever, like, they see the entire, like, army of just, like, like angelic forces, well, apparently that's like constantly around us and we just don't even know, right? Uh, the Bible does not detail. Like, like that's why I had to go back to that one story because it's very unique, right? Uh, so we just have to realize that there's a lot of places where the Bible does not tell us things and that's okay, right? That is totally fine. Um, and we can still say the Bible is sufficient while allowing for this, mm-hmm. right? Because we're not saying it's sufficient for all the knowledge in the world. That's not what we're saying. We're saying it's sufficient for accomplishing its goal. Right? And its goal is to teach man how to start a relationship with God and how to live out that relationship with God. Mm. Right? Uh, that, that's really what the Bible's goal is. Right? God's commitment to dwelling with man again? All right, well, what does man have to do in order to hop on the train? Mm. That's what the Bible's seeking out to accomplish, and it succeeds sufficiently in doing that. Implications of the Bible's sufficiency. Because God's Word gives us direct insight to His plans, purposes, uh, promises, and purposes, And because it is sufficient for faith and godliness, it should be the foundation of what we believe. Wow, I've got a lot of notifications on my watch. Sorry, I'm having to delete these. It's ridiculous. All right. Um, So yeah, uh, because it's sufficient and it teaches all these things, it should teach us what we believe, right? Because 
yes, you can pick up on certain fundamental truths outside of the Bible, but since we believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, and because we believe that it is true, and because we believe it is authoritative, and because we believe it adequately teaches us everything we need to conduct ourselves in life, well, then it should be the basis of what we believe. And everything outside the Bible should be tested by what is inside of it, right? Uh, if somebody over here is telling me to do something and that runs in contradiction to what the Bible says, well, I know that the Bible is sufficient for life and godliness. And so I don't care what this person tells me, and I don't care if they try to convince me that it's what I need to do to be a good Christian. They're wrong because the Bible has already given me the principles, right? Uh, that doesn't mean that there, like, there are godly things that you can do that aren't found in Scripture, right? But they should be built on principles found in Scripture, right? Because obviously how you handle social media as a Christian, that's not going to be found in Scripture, mm -hmm. right? Because it wasn't written at a time period when social media existed. Mm -hmm. But there are principles found in Scripture that can teach you how to conduct yourself as a Christian using social media, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so that's ultimately what we have to get out there. Secondly, it should be the foundation of how we view God, right? Um, this is where we go to, right? There are all these people with all these different religions who will view God in different ways. People will say that God is the universe, right? Or they will view God in a limited sense, like the Greeks and the Romans, Right? Or they will say that there's multiple gods and stuff like that. Well, if we believe that scripture is sufficient for life and godliness, well, that means that it is sufficient to teach us who God is and what he wants done. So we can't allow the cultures around us to define what God is. Scripture can. Right? And scripture alone. Right? And that means that if we, like, as Christians, sometimes we do put God in boxes. Right? Uh, like, we create theologies that go beyond what scripture says. We need to be careful of that, yeah. right? A lot of scripture, like, that's one thing that a lot of Christians, they they don't realize they're doing it, right? They do it out of good intentions, right? But, like, they'll say, well, God is good, and therefore he would never do this thing. Okay, hold up. Who's defining the word good there? Are you allowing God to define it, or are you defining it, right? Like, this is one thing that people will do with scripture, right? Uh, like, whenever God instructs the Israelites to kill the Canaanites, right? A lot of people they will like freak out over that and they'll start getting embarrassed of God and they'll be like, well, God is good and so he would never tell them to do that. Well, okay. Well, now you're imposing your definition of good on God. God is the author of good. And so, if he is good, then whether you can justify it or not, you've got to say that that was okay. Right? Fortunately, I think if you examine the scriptures, justifications are given and you can explain, you can understand why God would do that. But you have to realize that the, the God that Scripture establishes is not a God who we have the right to question or demand explanations from. He is a God who's in charge of all things. He owes explanations to nobody. The cool thing is that he's a God of grace who gives explanations a lot. But we have to realize that as Christians all the time, we do try to conform God to our certain boxes of just like, you know, we have like these certain moral boxes of like, oh, this is how I view good. And therefore, God can never deviate from that. Well, you know what? God gets to decide what is good, not you. And so if you have a problem with something that God's doing, the problem is with you, not God. And there's a lot of things that God has told. I mean, go read the prophets. There are certain things that God says in the prophets that many Christians nowadays would never be comfortable saying. Right? He uses language that would make your grandma blush. Right? But that's a good God saying these things. Right? And he's a good and holy and pure and righteous God saying those things. But a lot of times, even as Christians, we put God in boxes, but that's because we're not allowing Scripture to be sufficient, right? We are saying, no, Scripture is insufficient for this. My worldview needs to be attached to this, and therefore, I'm going to have to change how I interpret Scripture. No, let Scripture speak for itself, and let Scripture define how you view God, right? If Scripture says God is good, and if God speaks like this, well, then you need to develop a moral system that allows God to speak like that while also being good, Right? It doesn't mean that you have to come up with an excuse for why God couldn't do that because it makes you uncomfortable, right? Does that? Do you understand how I'm trying to convey all that? Was somebody going to say something? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it goes back to uh, Genesis three when Adam and Eve tried to, to. Well, they got deceived by the lie of the devil, and when the devil said, "If you eat this fruit, you will be like God," but the but the point of the matter was they were already like God, so they let the enemy. Um, 
twist the definition of good. Well, yeah, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. Ever since that time. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll just say yes, but uh, yeah, very good. Yeah. It should also be the foundation for how we view ourselves, right? If scripture is sufficient, uh, not only does it teach us how to view God correctly, it teaches us how to view ourselves correctly. Mm. Our culture is going to try to teach us a bunch of other stuff, right? Um, they are going to try to teach us that, you know, you need to treat yourself and you need to do this. Like, like the, They'll teach you a very narcissistic worldview, which I think we see embodied in our world nowadays. And not just nowadays, right? This has been something that's throughout all human history, right? Uh, I'm just citing that you see it true nowadays. Mm-hmm. Um, Really, what, what's interesting nowadays is that what people used to do privately, they now just declare publicly. And what used to simply be reserved for the aristocracy and like the royal people is now just like everybody's thing, right? Where now we just openly admit that like, there's this whole like self love movement where like it's all about me, me, me. I want to treat myself. I want to do this. That used to be like something that most people knew was just bad. Uh, and it was mainly just like the emperors and the kings and stuff who would have that mentality. Nowadays, it's just our culture, but it's probably because we live like emperors and kings nowadays, right? Uh, to where we have the luxury of free time and all these things to where um, we really love serving ourselves, right? And we have made ourselves the center of the universe, right? Well, when you read the Bible, the world does not revolve around us, right? We are not the main character of the story. Interestingly, David's not the main character of the story. Mm-hmm. Moses isn't the main character of the story. Mm-hmm. And they recognize that, right? Moses... This dude's amazing, right? You read his story and you're left impressed by all the stuff this dude's doing. But throughout the whole story, he comes to recognize I'm not the main character. Mm -hmm. Like, like whenever he's like getting ready to die, he says, guys, it's all right. I'm going to appoint Joshua. And you know what? Joshua's a nobody too. Like like if you go read Deuteronomy, he says, y'all don't need me. Because his whole point is that God's the one you need, right? So whenever you read the Bible, because it is sufficient, it is teaching you a worldview. The world revolves around God, Amen. right? Not us, right? Whereas if you go out of the world, it'll teach you that the world revolves around you, right? Uh, which is really difficult if you have, like, no wonder there's so much conflict in the world and no wonder there's so much sin in the world because you have all these people who have different gravitational forces, right? If the world revolves around me, then everything should be drawn to me. But if it, the world revolves around Sean, well, everything should be drawn to him. Yeah. And if I want things drawn to me and Sean wants things drawn to him, well, now we're, we got a problem and we got to deal with this, right? Uh, and then you have all of us, and think about it, billions of people in the world, all of whom are the center of the world. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be lust. There's going to be pride. There's going to be sin, right? This is how it happens. Whereas when you read the Bible, you've got to realize you're not the center of the universe at the same time. That doesn't mean that people are worthless, right? Because if you go read other ancient texts, Um, Like the creation account, oh my gosh, it's so sad, right? The gods are first off really petty, and they'll create this entire world, and they'll be like, oh, you know what? I'm too lazy to actually take care of it. Um, I guess I'll make humans as a slave to take care of the world. And that's how they'll create humans, right? So humans are like an afterthought after the gods have created the worlds, and they'll be like, here, go take care of it. That's not the biblical worldview of the Bible. The Bible's like, okay, you're not the center of the universe, but the God who is the center of the universe in some way, like, he created the world to give to you. And he creates man in his image. So, on one hand, man's not the center of the universe, but man is deserving of dignity and respect because he was made in the image of God. And so, if you're reading the Bible, it teaches you how to view man, right? You have to view yourself in a humble manner where you're saying, okay, I'm not the center of the universe, but you view everybody else as somebody who does deserve respect even though they're not the center of the universe, But it's not because of who they are in and of themselves. It's because of who they were made to image, right? The reason why y'all deserve respect is not because y'all are great people. Because when I read the Bible, I realize humans aren't great. But I realize that they were all created in the image of God. And because God is great, I'll respect you and I'll love you, even my enemies, right? So you see how, like, just reading the Bible will teach you this worldview But if you don't treat the Bible as sufficient, you will allow other things to inform that worldview and shape it otherwise, right? And that's where we find, uh, even in in our churches, people really mess up because um, people will hold to certain views about, like, um, like, there's certain cultural things they'll take for granted about how we should function that are being informed, not by the Bible, but just by 
their own thing. Uh, I remember one of my favorite things ever was um, one time I was up at Beaumont for like, I think you were, uh, like Brienne was dancing when she was on the dance team. And I remember Finn called me, right? Like Finn, Finn of here, he, he gave me a phone call. And I walked out in the hallway and he asked me a question that he, he was like, David, is God okay with us taking vacations? And ultimately I was like, well, yeah, God's okay with us taking vacations. Um, but we ended up having a good long conversation about it because first off, it was a question I had never even stopped to consider. It was something I just taken for granted because in our culture, everybody takes vacations. But then I was like, you know what? Like it made me really appreciate Finn's mind because he wasn't willing to just take it for granted. He wanted to make sure like, is this a thing? Like, like he wanted to make sure how do I best live as a servant of God and how do I make the most of my time serving him, serving my family, stuff like that. And him and I had this great conversation where we were breaking down like, like just like a worldview established by the Bible. Okay, well, yes, God wants us to serve him, but God also wants us to take rest and God wants us to take care of our families. Okay, well, how do you keep all those in tension, right? And ultimately the conclusion we came to was like, yes, God allows for vacations, but nowadays... Like, we, we probably take a lot more vacations than we need. Because <laughs> nowadays we've made vacations less about resting and taking care of our families and loving one another. And it's more about serving myself and being lethargic, right? Um, like, so, so we, we, but we had a great conversation about it. Because it was something I'd never stopped to even consider. But I love that he did. Because he was wanting the Bible to teach him his view of self. Right? I thought that was a really good example of that where I had failed. Um, and, and Finn's actually really good at that, like, which like with really little things, like even like video games, he was like, how do we react to video games? Right? Like, how do we want to handle that? Um, I, I think that's very good. Uh, fourthly, it should teach us, uh, it should be the foundation for how we view others. I've already kind of talked about this, mm-hmm. right? So not only does scripture teach us a worldview of God and of self, but it also teaches us how we view others and how we conduct ourselves with them, right? Are we supposed to treat everybody around us? as a slave to do our bidding? No. But if you look at the culture around us, that's kind of how we treat them. Right? I mean, that, that's how culture would have us do it. They won't say that explicitly, but that's how we function, right? I mean, everybody's an object that is a means to meet an end that we want, right? Uh, and you see this even in like the most loving of ways, right? Whenever people donate to charities a lot of the times, it's not out of a genuine love. Usually, like, I mean, sometimes it might be. Um, but a lot of times, like, it'll be people donating to charities because they are using those people as a means to an end to help them gain a good reputation or to gain clout or to become more popular, right? Uh, and so people will use these things, like, they'll strip dignity away from people and they'll use them as a means to accomplish a selfish goal, right? Um, this beautiful woman who walked by is no longer a woman to be respected. She is an object of desire who I will now gaze upon. Um, and riz up and flirt with because she serves me now, right? Well, no wonder, once again, there's so much sin because we've shipped away people's dignity. Whereas if you read the Bible, you realize, okay, well, everybody's sinful, so they deserve to be great. Like, we, we should be gracious to them, but they're also made in God's image, so they deserve respect. So despite the fact they're sinful, that doesn't mean I should just, like, kill them. Well, no. I realize that I'm sinful as well, right? So if you're reading the Bible, it teaches you this worldview of, how do I relate to God? How do I relate to myself? How do I relate to others? It should also be the foundation of how we view the world, right? Um, is the world an inherently good or bad thing? Okay, well, it depends on what you mean by the world. Are you talking about the, the ways of the world or are you talking about the physical world? Okay, well, the ways of the world, well, they're on, that's, it's sinful, right? Because we're in a trajectory of sin, right? Everybody's a sinner. The ways of the world are sinful. Well, the physical world is a little more complicated. It was created good by God, but it's broken and cursed right now, right? And so now, if I'm just dealing with the the world itself, well, there's typhoons and there's there's hurricanes, and I might try to plant a garden and only get thorns, right? Only get weeds, right? And so, depends on how you you like define the word world, right? But the Bible teaches us how to view those things. It should be the foundation for how we interpret things. Right? Um, this conflict going over, like going off in like Israel right now. How do I interpret that? Right? Okay. Well, that one's a little bit easier, uh, but people act like it's not. But if you've read your Bible, 
from beginning to end, it's a much easier conflict to interpret, right? It, it should not be difficult to interpret that conflict if you've read the Bible. Okay, but let's make it a little more complicated. What about the thing over in Ukraine? Oh, that's a little bit more complicated now, but you can still use biblical principles to interpret it. Okay, how do I react whenever somebody's in charge of my government and I don't like them? Well, the Bible can teach you how to handle that, right? And how to interpret the situation, right? All right, what do I do whenever the government tells us to close our churches and wear masks? Well, what's interesting is like, whenever we see all that stuff happening, you see churches landing in different places, right? Well, the reason why is because they're using the Bible to interpret it and they're landing in different places. But that's still what we have to do. And sometimes, uh, and I think I was actually guilty of this, uh, sometimes we don't use the Bible to interpret things, we use our own feelings and we use our own desires. Well, that's an issue, right? Uh, ultimately, if the Bible is sufficient, we should use scripture to defend it and interpret it, not just ourselves, right? Uh, whereas I, I'd say, even like with all the COVID stuff, I, I probably was guilty of interpreting that through a primary like, nah, like it's, this is my desire lens. Um, but we can use the Bible to interpret all these different things we're going through in life. Seventhly, uh, seventhly and lastly, uh, it should be the foundation for how we live, right? Um, if somebody were to ask you why you did any given thing throughout the day, um, ideal scenario, you would have a Bible verse to defend it. Um, obviously, that would be a really long process. <laughs> uh, and not every, I mean, why did you wake up at 722 in the morning? That, that's not a, <laughs> you don't need a Bible verse to defend that. But there are a lot of things, right? Um, why did you handle that breakup in that way? Right? Why is it that when that person punched you in the face, you responded in the way that you did? Right? Why is it that you didn't grovel on the ground whenever you failed that exam? Right? Why is it that you were so gracious to that person whenever they rear-ended your car, right? That, you should be able to say, well, this is what the Bible says, right? Um, why is it that you submitted to the authorities even when you didn't like them? Well, this is what the Bible says, right? And so because the Bible is sufficient, these are the implications. It affects us from the internal, what we believe, all the way to the external, right? Like, th there's really so many different implications of this. Right? What we believe, how we view God, how we view self, how we view others, how we view the world, how we interpret things, how we live. Right? If scripture is sufficient, it should affect all of those things. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes? I think that seven point, that seventh point, um, I think, refers to the first six. Because if you um, believe the first six, it will affect how you live. Yeah. Well, really, the seventh one, it just... <laughs> Um, it, it requires application, yeah. right? Um, because all the first six are primarily internal, right? What we believe, how we view things, how we interpret things. Uh, the main thing that the seventh one is pointing out is that it, couldn't, it can't simply stay internal, right? All these things that you're deciding internally must flow out into application because that's ultimately what the sufficiency is aimed at, right? It is sufficient for life and godliness, right? It is sufficient to live. And the way you live is in light of all those other things. All right. There's the sufficiency of the Bible. We are going to cover one more thing, and that is the canonicity of the Bible, uh, which will be the easiest thing to cover because we've already talked so much about the canon. Right? Um, but since it comes to how we're viewing the Bible and we're talking about the things that flow from the inspiration of the Bible, um, this will be something we can address very quickly, uh, hence why I included this in the same video as sufficiency. So this is what I said about the canonicity of the Bible. I believe that scripture has a complete and closed canon. That is, I believe that scripture being inspired by God is composed of 66 canonical texts, the very words of God that are inspired, inerrant, authoritative, and collectively sufficient, and therefore worthy of preservation. I believe that the Old Testament is composed of 39 canonical books, recognized as inspired through authorship by the prophets, and therefore concluding at the disappearance of the prophetic office. I believe that the New Testament is composed of canonical books, collected and received by the church and recognized as inspired by apostolic authority and therefore concluding at the disappearance of the apostles. I believe that all scripture, Old and New Testaments alike, revolve around the person and work of Jesus Christ, through whom all things came into existence, through whom comes all life and salvation and truth, and through whom will come the culmination of all things. Uh, and once again, 
Uh, like all the other things we talked about here, the canon, uh, the, the idea of canon flows from inspiration, right? If God has inspired books of the Bible, we need to figure out which ones, right? Um, like that, that, that's kind of where we get there, right? So if God has inspired things, well, they're authoritative because God is our authority, right? If God has inspired things, well, they are true because God is a God of truth. If God has given these things and he has claimed they're sufficient, well, then they're sufficient. Well, if God has said something, then we need to, th there's parameters, right? Because not everything in the world was declared by God, right? And so if he said something, we need to figure out where to put the quotation marks, right? Where does it start? Where does it end? That's where we get the idea of canon. Does the Bible claim to be canonical? Uh, for this, I'll just say, in our discussion of the canon of Scripture in Unit 1, we already examined, one, how the authors of Scripture viewed themselves as writing authoritatively, and secondly, how the recipients of Scripture treated it as authoritative, thus serving as the foundation of the canon. Uh, so, since we've already belabored the information, we will skip over it here and go straight to the implications. So, if you want to know whether or not Scripture claims to be canonical, just go back to the earlier videos, right? Because they've all been recorded, they're all online. Um, and so, if you want to defend that, go back to it. I'm not going to do it again because we got other stuff we need to cover. Um, so, implications of the Bibles, um, that should say canonicity, not canonical, um, but I probably made this PowerPoint like three in the morning a few months ago, so be gracious with me. Because God's Word consists of a closed canon, the books in that canon should be viewed as authoritative. Hey, that's something we already kind of talked about. Ah. <laughs> Secondly, the books in that canon should be viewed as telling a story, right? That is, each individual book, uh, as well as each collection of books, can be viewed as communicating something unique and specific in God's unfolding plans, right? This is important, right? Because if it's canonical, right, if there's a beginning and an end to it, well, something was communicated throughout that, right? That's just how communication works, right? Whenever I state a sentence, something was communicated in that sentence, right, from the beginning of, to the end of it. Okay, well, if God has given us inspired texts, well, then there's something being communicated from beginning to end. And if that text can be separated into sections, well, then there's something communicated from beginning to end of each of those sections. And since a lot of it is narrative, it tells a story, right? It starts in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. It ends in the end when God is finishing up recreating the heavens and the earth, right? It starts where there's a garden with two trees in the middle. It ends with a garden city with one tree, right? And there's a river of life. Like, like, so if you look at it, there is a story here, and it is a closed canon. And we should try to figure out what that story is. Thirdly, the books in that canon should be viewed as complete. That is, nothing should be added to or taken away from the text, and any attempts to do so should not be taken lightly. Right? People will quote the book of Revelation to defend this, um, but whenever the book of Revelation talks about not adding to or taking away from the text, it's primarily talking about the book of Revelation. The main reason we don't want to add to or take away from Scripture is because it's God's Word, right? Um, if it, like, like, you can't just, like, I can't just write something and say, okay, it's Bible. Well, no, because I am simply a man. The only way that something gets added into Scripture is if it is from God. Right? And the only thing something gets taken away from Scripture is if it is not from God. And that has always been how it is. Right? Whenever we examined the Scriptures, like the canon of Scripture before, that was, remember, what we were looking for. Right? In the Old Testament, we were trying to figure out, are these things from legitimate prophets? Right? And Moses gave us prophetic tests. Right? And he gave us a prophetic test, consistency test. How do we figure out that this actually came from God? Well, the New Testament, it's apostolic authority. Right? So there were ways to figure out whether or not something's from God. Well, the way that the New Testament ends, it's not expecting any future revelation, right? The way the Old Testament ended, it was anticipating future revelation. And whenever you actually examine between the Old and New Testament, you actually have people talking about the fact that prophets are off the scene right now, but we're expecting them to come back in the future, right? Well, the way the New Testament ends, the only other thing on the prophetic timetable is Jesus returning, right? And that's why whenever you have, like, Latter-day Saints coming up, and they're like, hey, here's the Book of Mormon. No. No, you can't add that to the Bible because the Bible doesn't allow for it. Right? The Bible is complete. Right? It, is, it has been concluded. Right? What started in Genesis is completed in Revelation. We already have the whole story. That doesn't mean God can't reveal things to people, but it just means it's not going to be in Scripture. 
right? Like that, like this is the complete story. And if you show up later on saying, oh, here's a new hidden book of the Bible. No, we've already got the whole story, right? Uh, and unless you can prove to me that that came from the, the Apostle John, don't even, don't even talk to me about it, right? Uh, and so um, that, that's how we have to view that. And then um, lastly, and this will be our conclusion for the whole night, um, the books in that canon should be viewed as unified. That is, despite their various flavors and focuses, they communicate one overall message by which they can, in their entirety, be interpreted. Right? Um, this is just part of canon, right? Because remember, what does the word canon mean? Do you remember? Enclosed? No. Just a guess. It means a rule or measurement. Right? Remember it was originally based on like a stick or a branch? Yeah. Right? Uh, it's like a rod. Right? So a canon, it refers to the rule, the standard. Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, there might be a story throughout there, but apparently it is testifying to one thing. Right? There's something that unifies the story. Right? Uh, this is what people talk about, like, once again, when they talk about the Star Wars canon, right? Okay, well, what is that rule? What is the thing that makes that authoritative, right? What is the thing that unifies the Star Wars canon, right? Well, depending on what fan you talk to, they're going to have different canons, and the reason why is because they feel different things unify it, right? Well, with the Bible, we don't have the authority to change the canon, right? God's the one who establishes the canon, and so... If I'm a Star Wars fan, I can be like, you know what? I don't count the sequel trilogy. That's fine. You know what? George Lucas has no authority over me. I can do whatever I want. I, don't, I can't do that with the Bible. Mm -hmm. With the Bible, God has authority. He decides what is from him and what's not. Right? Uh, but it is, I mean, if you're going with the Star Wars analogy, there is a parallel in the sense of, you know, you can't simply say, oh, this came from George Lucas when it didn't. Right? Like, no. <laughs> that, that's, now that's false. Mm -hmm. Right? And so in that same way, you can't adjust the canon that way. But when it comes to the Bible, there's a closed canon. God's the one who's in charge of it. And our goal is to figure out what is the unifying standard? What is the measurement? And that's why in my discussion of it, like in my little like thing that I quoted, I pointed out that all scripture should be read in light of Jesus Christ. Right? Because if, like, if you read the story of scripture, my seven word summary is God's commitment to dwelling with man again. How did he achieve that? Through Jesus, right? And so, whether you're in the book of Genesis or in Revelation, it all revolves around Jesus, right? Genesis chapter 3, the moment after sin entered the world, what does God promise? Jesus is going to show up, right? You read through the passage, right? You get to Genesis 12, God calls Abraham, right? And he promises that his seed is going to bless the world. Who's he talking about? Jesus. Goes through Isaac, through Jacob. You get to Judah, and God talks, like, God through Jacob talks to Judah and says, the rule, like the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. The word Shiloh means he unto whom it belongs, right? So he says that Judah is going to be the ruling tribe of the people until one person comes from Judah to whom the ruling staff belongs. Who's he talking about? Jesus. Well, that's all in Genesis. We go to Revelation. Well, the opening words are the revelation of Jesus Christ, right? And I would argue that every book in between testifies to Jesus. For the first 39 books, you don't know his name, right? For the back, back 27, you know his name. But all of them are unified by him, right? And so, since the Bible is canonical, it should be viewed as authoritative, viewed as telling a story, viewed as complete, and viewed as unified, and we should read it as such. That being said, that is our end, uh, the end of our discussion on how to view the Bible. Uh, next week, we are going to start... Uh, a multiple week thing on how to read the Bible. Uh, and we are going to just, just talk about like basic Bible study methods, um, just different ways to go into the Bible uh, to really just get the most out of it and read it correctly um, and not interpret things horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Any questions? Well, that was great. Cool. Um, that actually just worked out. I honestly was not even looking at my watch. And we just happened to finish at 8. So that just... Uh, Good timing. All right, one of y'all want to close out in prayer? Thank you. Thank you. Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us to gather here together to learn more about you and your word. Um, God, I pray that as we leave um, this study that we can think about all the things that we learned about today, even though some of them might be really deep and some of them might be hard to understand. Um, 
allow us to rely on our faith in you and knowing that we can trust in you to guide us um, and to give us wisdom. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you are and all that you do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.